Hey there, sports history fan. This is Arnie Chapman of the Football History Dude Podcast, and I'm stopping by this show real quick to tell you about a couple of cool giveaways that we have going on here at the network. Both are autographed books covering various topics of the NFL. The first is The Point After, How One Resilient Kicker Learned There Is More to Life Than the NFL by ex-NFL kicker Sean Conley. It goes over his unique experience as a walk-on kicker at the University of Pitt after never playing high school football. And then it gets into some of his time playing for NFL teams and so much more beyond the gridiron. The other is from author Kevin Bryant. His book is titled Spies on the Sidelines, the High Stakes World of NFL Espionage. This book started as a curiosity, kind of a passion project to understand everything revolving around well, Spygate. But this put Kevin down a rabbit hole learning about all sorts of espionage that has occurred throughout the history of the NFL. Both permissible <laughs> and often the illicit techniques of gathering intel to try to impact the outcome of the game. To sign up for your chance to win an autographed copy of one of these books, all you gotta do is head over to sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash giveaways and sign up. That's sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash giveaways. Again, check out all the other podcasts that we have in the Sports History Network as well. But now, back to your regularly scheduled journey to the Sports History Timeline. In this episode on Football History, we discuss a very odd play from the 1954 Cotton Bowl game and some of the legendary people associated with the contest and the controversy is stirred. This story and more is coming up in just a moment. This is the Pigskin Daily History Dispatch, a podcast that covers the anniversaries of American football events throughout history on a day-to-day basis. Your host, Darren Hayes, is podcasting from America's North Shore to bring you the memories of the gridiron one day at a time. So as we come out of the tunnel of the Sports History Network, let's take the field and go no huddle through the portal of positive gridiron history with pigskindispatch.com. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Hello, my football friends. This is Darren Hayes of pigskindispatch.com. Welcome once again to the Pigpen, your portal to positive football history. And we're going to look in that portal today and look back to the season of 1953 and how it culminated on the January 2nd game of 1954 at the Cotton Bowl with a very strange instance indeed and a ruling that uh, had a little bit of question to it, raised a few eyebrows. So back on January 2nd, 1954, the annual Cotton Bowl game was played and the Rice Owls matched their 11 against the formidable Crimson Tide of Alabama. Rice was a powerhouse on the gridiron in that era, and they were the champs of the Southeastern Conference. The SEC was Alabama, and they went up against the top team of the Southwestern Conference, the SWC, the Rice Owls. So SEC versus SWC at the Cotton Bowl. Now, Rice was led by head coach Jess Neely, who was in his 14th season on the Owls' sidelines that year. And the Owls were not strangers to the Cotton Bowl, as they played there earlier in the 1953 season in October when SMU hosted them in one of the two defeats of Rice that season. Uh, the Mustangs held on and won a thriller there near Dallas, 12-7 over Rice. The other uh, season's L for Rice uh, that year was a heartbreaking home defeat at the hands of number 19 ranked Kentucky in a 13 to 19 ball game. So on the positive side, Rice opened the season by knocking off number 15 Florida 20 to 16 and later had wins over rival Texas 18 to 13. Uh, Arkansas, they blew out 47 to nothing. Texas A&M, they really beat them up pretty good too with a score of 34 to 7. TCU is a close game, 19 to 6, but Rice prevailed. And Baylor, they really uh, just pounded them, 41 to 19. Uh, their other two victories on an 8 and 2 campaign were the Cornell uh, Big Red, they beat them 28 to 7, and Hardin Simmons College uh, was defeated 28 to 7 as well. Hence, uh, this impressive team went on to reach the ranking of number six in the national rankings that year. 
Now, quarterback Leroy Fentemaker, uh, he was also their kicker. And leading rusher Dickie Mogul were the offensive stars of the Owls that season. The Crimson Tide, on the other hand, were led by coach Harold Drew in his seventh season at the helm. And Alabama entered the Cotton Bowl ranked 13th as they finished with a 6-2-3 record with losses to number 2 Maryland and an upstart Mississippi Southern in the very first game of the season. Uh, They got that little surprise shocker to open your year. Uh, The ties were against LSU, Tennessee, and Mississippi State. So all very formidable foes. Uh, and a 6-2-3 and three record was nothing to be ashamed of with that schedule. The Tide's starting quarterback of the year, well, there was a young fella named Bart Starr. Perhaps you heard of him. Great Green Bay a Packer quarterback, Hall of Famer in the Professional Football uh, professional football Hall of Fame uh, is Bart Starr. Now, the game started well for Alabama as halfback Tommy Lewis, a big, strong guy, plunged across a goal line for an early 6 to nothing tied lead. Now Rice answered the bell in the second quarter when Dickie Mogul scampered and darted his way through the Bama defense on a great 79-yard touchdown run. And Leroy fenced the maker's kick was true and the Owls were up 7-6. to six. Uh, you know, Took over the lead. Now the Rice defense then thwarted the Tide's offense and the Owls had the ball back again soon. And this time they were pinned down at their own 5-yard line. Then lightning struck twice as Mogul knifed his way through the to the open field, appearing to be outrunning everybody down the Alabama sideline. As uh, Dicky passed midfield, running back Tommy Lewis, the one that scored a touchdown earlier for Alabama, came off of the sideline, frustrated, without a helmet on, and left the Alabama bench, came out on the field of play, and just buried him with a shoulder pad right into the the lower legs, uh, taking. The mogul right to the turf, uh, and you know that was uh, dropped the, the runner uh, mogul at the Alabama 42-yard line. Now we have a, a great footage of this. We have an embedded YouTube video on PigskinDispatch.com. Uh, so to follow the show note here. We can, you can go and watch that video of it. It's pretty pretty excellent. Very good. You get to also see Dickie Mogul's first touchdown run that 79-yarder. Well, as a result of the action, you know, the referee, as soon as he got tackled, was pointing towards the bench because he saw that, uh, you know, the Tommy Lewis, the halfback, came off of the bench. You know, wasn't a substitute. He was a a non-player at the time and, um, you know, definitely illegal. He pointed it. The officials, uh, you know, got around with each other and ended up giving the score uh, to Rice on that 95-yard touchdown. He, he was definitely on the loose. I don't know that anybody was going to catch him because he would, you could, as you can see in the video, it's pretty evident he was probably going to score. Well, that second quarter tackle of Dickie Mogul on the second long run of the day sparked that controversy in the game as they were awarded the touchdown. Now, the, the argument was, well, no, you know, it's just a, it's a foul, yeah, but they shouldn't be get, you know, you don't penalize with a touchdown. Well, what do you think the rule is on that today? I'm not exactly sure what the rule was then, but by to- today's rules, yes, a touchdown could be awarded. Uh, if there was such an unfair act that you know prevented a, a team from scoring, just like this was, you know, with uh, him coming off the bench and tackling a, a guy that's in the clear running down the sideline, well, that could be deemed and warranted to give points to the team that was offended. In this case, they did. They gave Rice the the touchdown. Uh, Dickie Mogul gets credit for that 95-yard run. The yardage, I believe, went to Dickie Mogul in that game, the extra 42 yards. And, uh, you know, I'm not sure. You know, I'm sure there was a flag thrown on it, too. I'm not sure if they let uh, Lewis back in the game or not. Uh, that could have been something in question that may have been in question today. But I think they got it right, and in the spirit of the rule, Yes, the referee can make a decision like that if it's something that's so unjust and unfair. Remember, the the rules are to provide a fair and level playing field. If you're taking points off the, you know, a team, guys obviously on a touchdown run and somebody does an illegal act to prevent him from getting in there, but you can't really prevent him from scoring. Uh, That's giving a disadvantage to that offensive team. Um, So I think they got it right and uh, rectified it. And in the aftermath, uh, you know, ended up uh, Mogul ended up scoring another long run from 34 yards out, 
and uh, another Owls player scored later in the game. And Rice Owls won and beat Alabama at the Cotton Bowl 28 to 6 was the final for that game with that very controversial play inside of it. And we've got the video embedded on our Pigskin Dispatch page. You can go to the show notes and uh, follow the link. It'll take you right there to watch that video. So I hope you enjoyed this little bit of history. That's a, a little bit of a questionable call, kind of an odd thing in history to, to witness. And you get to see that great video of it too. It's just unbelievable. You're astonished to, to see him do that. So uh, watch the reaction of the player, the, the Tommy Lewis, as he after he made the tackle, he was sort of pumped about it that he made it and uh, until he saw that it was costing his team, uh, you know, they didn't really do anything to, to stop this to help his team out it just harmed them so hope you enjoyed this history hope you join us each and every day for more you can also find uh, my friends over on the sports history network we got uh, about 25 of us over there just churning away putting podcasts and posts up every single day sportshistorynetwork.com and our sister uh website is jerseydispatch.com and we have that sports jersey dispatch podcast i know you've been enjoying it. we've been putting it in the feed of pigskin dispatch as well at the sports breaks every day and we're going to have a couple specials coming up uh talking about some great uh old-time baseball uh we'll have those to look forward to on the jerseydispatch.com and the sports jersey dispatch podcast so till tomorrow everybody for this podcast have a great gridiron day Peeking up at the clock, the time's running down. We're going to go into victory formation, take a knee, and let this baby run out. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you back tomorrow for the next podcast. We invite you to check out our website, pigskindispatch.com, not only to see the daily football history, but to experience positive football with our many articles on the good people of the game, as well as our own football comic strip, Cleet Marks Comics. Pigskindispatch.com is also on social media outlets, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and don't forget the Pigskin Dispatch YouTube channel to get all of your positive football news and history. A special thanks to the talents of Mike and Gene Monroe, as well as Jason Neff for letting us use their music during our podcast. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. It was just another ordinary day in the offices of the Pittsburgh Guardian newspaper circa 1924. But for Marla Delft, assistant editor, everything was about to change. For she was about to discover the awesome attractiveness of Row 1 brand retro sports paraphernalia items, thanks to Orville Mulligan, sports writer. And there it is. Wow, Orville, that's really the bee's knees. Isn't it just? A poster-sized replica of the actual 1909 World Series program cover. I can see that. But where did you get it? And where'd you get it framed? I ordered it from the Row 1 website, where over 6,000 items of sports memorabilia from the 1880s to the 1990s are available for reproduction, in multiple sizes and in several different materials, with over a dozen styles of frame to choose from for prints like this. Well, I'm sure Mr. Delft would love to put up more of these in the office. But I'm equally as sure they're beyond this newspaper's budget. (laughs) Not at all, my dear Marla. See for yourself. Go to sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one. Sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one. Oh my, these are good prices. Oh, and look at this stuff. Oklahoma, Nebraska football. College basketball art. Michael Jordan items. And so it was that Marla Delt discovered the splendiferous magic of row one sports memorabilia arts and prints. You can, too, by visiting sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one. That's R-O-W number one today for access to the full row one catalog of gallery prints and gifts like t-shirts, long sleeve shirts, telephone cases, coffee mugs, blankets, pillows, towels, and even shower curtains. Act today for a 15% discount off all prints with coupon code SHN15 and 20% off all other items with coupon code SHN20 at check out and keep your dial locked to the sports history network for the exciting chronicles of the 1920 sports world in orville mulligan sports writer coming soon